Good morning everybody and uh, welcome uh, to worship this day as uh, we gather uh, to uh, praise our Lord and our Saviour. Uh, we do welcome you whether you're watching on uh, Facebook or YouTube just now uh, and we pray that you will uh, receive from God all that God has in store for you this day. I'm just going to pray before I hand over to Stuart who's going to uh, just uh, lead us in, in uh, a thought uh, before we sing our first song, uh, Ancient uh, Words. So let's, let's pray. Lord, Lord Jesus, uh, we uh, just come to you uh, just now and we thank you for the blessing of this new day. We thank you, Lord, that we can uh, gather uh, online just now to uh, worship you, to uh, to uh, be blessed by you, Lord, uh, to receive from your word, Lord, this day. Lord, I pray, Lord, that as, as we gather, uh, Lord, that we will uh, remember to put our hope, our trust in you, Lord, this day. Lord, I pray, Lord, uh, for Stuart as he opens uh, our time together uh, just now, Lord, I pray, Lord, that he will uh, uh, bring uh, your words uh, to us. Uh, and as we sing, uh, Lord, we pray, Lord, you will accept our offering of praise and worship. And as I speak uh, on Malachi later on, Lord, uh, again, Lord, that you will just uh, uh, speak to our hearts as well as our minds uh, this day, Lord, so that we will, uh, so that we will uh, live for you. Uh, in these days that we live in. Lord, I pray all of this in, in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I'm just going to hand over to Stuart, who's going to uh, lead us uh, in our opening. Okay, we often, um, come on everyone, we often hear about famous question about why does God allow wars and why does God allow pandemics, why does he intervene in all these things and there's always been a question for me that struck, I struggle to answer that question until now, but basically now, I want us to turn to Matthew 24 and we're going to read the four eight verses. Um, and Jesus came out of the temple and was going away and his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. And he answered and said to them, Do you, do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here shall be left upon one another, which will not be torn down. And as he was sitting in the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of age? And Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one will mislead you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. And you will be hearing of wars and rumours of wars. See that you are not frightened, for these things must take place, but that is not the end. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. These things are merely the beginning of their times. Now while I was reading this, I was thinking about what Jesus being eternal, the eternal Son of God, and that he could stop, he could uh, intervene in all these things, but he says these things will happen. So I was thinking, you know, we shouldn't be looking at COVID, we shouldn't be looking at all these things, we should be looking for Jesus to intervene in these things. He, that's not what he died in the cross. He died to give us eternal life and it's it's in the eternity of Christ that we should be looking to in heaven and taking our eyes off the things of the world and things that are on the earth. For years, like we've had, he said wars are going to happen, he said pandemics are going to happen, he said I won't, that's not, that's not what the church in Bible is about, it's about, you know, Christ, heaven, what he did in the cross to save us, and our life won't start and won't improve or won't whatever if we were looking for until we get into heaven and we spend eternity with the Lord Jesus. And that's why I believe that even though he could intervene and stop wars and rumors of wars, that's for the world to do, that's for the unsaved to do, and they don't do it. So that's just a little message about how Jesus is the eternal Son of God. We look to him as the church in the building, and we look to our 
haven't even gone more than so not on the team fell down on the air. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart, for reminding us that we need to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and not on the things of this earth. Uh, we're going to sing together just now as we sing ancient words. Long preserved for our war in this world, they resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart words of love, words of hope, give us strength, help us. In this world, wherever we roam, ancient words will guide us home. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts. Uh, thank you for joining with us as uh, we sang there, as we were reminded there that the words of God, the words that we read in Scripture, uh, are God's words and they're words to uh, uh, impart uh, wisdom uh, to, to us, uh, words to give us hope, uh, to bring us life uh, as, as we read them, as we study them, as we meditate on them. And that's what we're going to do this morning as we... So, as, as we look at Malachi chapter 4. So, we're looking at Malachi chapter 4. And we're looking at the whole chapter. Uh, don't worry, it's only uh, six verses. And it's not uh, a long chapter this morning. 
And so Malachi chapter 4, starting at verse 1. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and the rules that I have commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts and fathers to their children, and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest they come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Shall we pray? Lord God, uh, we uh, thank you again for uh, just uh, the faithfulness of those who have written down uh, your words uh, for us. Uh, Lord, uh, we, we thank you, Lord, that Malachi was one of those who was faithful uh, in, in writing down all that you said to him uh, to write down. Uh, and Lord, as, as we read that uh, thousands uh, of years later, Lord, uh, we recognise, Lord, that they're, they're words for his day, but they're also words for us, Lord, words so, Lord, that can bring us hope, can bring us life. And Lord, I pray, Lord, as we've read, as we uh, open that up and, and uh, look at uh, what it means for us today, Lord, that you will, uh, you will inspire us, Lord, that you will bless us, Lord, that you will um, give us the truth, Lord, that we need to hear. Lord, so that we can honour you, so that we can uh, glorify your name in our generation, and Lord, that we can pass on your words of truth to the next generation. Lord, I ask this in your name. Amen. So we come to the end of our series in Malachi uh, today, uh, and well, one of the things we, we, we've noticed, that one of the big themes within in the book of Malachi is, is to take God seriously. Uh, Malachi is speaking after, the, uh, after Judah has returned uh, to the land uh, after exile into Babylon. <coughs> Sorry. And they've rebuilt the temple. It's after Haggai and uh, Zechariah. Uh, and uh, they, they've rebuilt the temple, they've rebuilt the city walls, and the next generation, uh, Malachi's generation, they've started not taking God seriously. They've started neglecting their worship, they've started neglecting uh, their wives, uh, that they've started uh, marrying foreign women uh, again, and, and although they're not necessarily practicing idolatry themselves like past generations uh, in the land they're allowing it to happen in their their homes uh, through their their marriage partners and and all of this uh, God is saying this is not acceptable for people I have set apart to be a light to the nations for me and so, so God, through Malachi, is calling his people back, calling them to repentance, calling them to a holiness that only he can give them, so that they're ready to receive the seed that he promised, the seed that he promised Eve, the seed that he promised Abraham, the seed that he promised David. And he is preparing the way, even hundreds of years before Christ comes. And so, so as we come to the end of this chapter, uh, end of this uh, little uh, book uh, in chapter 4, uh, Malachi, he, he's bringing together all of what he's really been saying. 
and reminding the people that God is sovereign. God is in control and God determines our future. And he, he does it by reminding the people that the day of judgment is coming. A day of judgment is coming. And for those of us who are saved, those of us who are in fellowship with Christ and we're in Christ Jesus, that shouldn't be something that causes us to fear, but it should actually be something that causes us to rejoice. And we'll look at that in a minute. But for those who are not in Christ Jesus, it should bring fear so that they humble themselves and come to Christ in repentance and seek his forgiveness. Because the day of judgment is coming, uh, he, Malachi reminds those who are faithful to God, those who are in Christ, in other words, as we look at it uh, post uh, New Testament. We see that the righteous will see a new day. The day of judgment isn't the end. The righteous will see a new day. There's also a call here to obedience. And then at the end he reminds us what the day of the Lord is going to look like. So let's uh, delve right in in verse 1 as, as we look at the day of judgment coming. And again, it's a reminder, uh, but, but by Malachi writing this, for behold, he says in verse 1, the day is coming. He's reminding us to take God seriously, to take worship seriously, to take our giving seriously, which we looked at last week. To take our covenant with God and with God's people seriously to take our, those of us who are married to take our marriage covenant seriously and it's a reminder of the sovereignty of God over his creation and the sovereignty sovereignty of God sorry I, can't, can't, I haven't got my teeth in this morning for some reason um, and the sovereignty of God is really God's rules, uh, God's controls, uh, God uh, governs all things. In other words, he is set above everything and it's his will that will be done. Now for those who know God, know how good God is and know how good God's will is for our lives, those who don't know him think that's controlling, think that's manipulative and will think that uh, God only wants to kill our joy, kill our happiness. Who wants to subdue us, wants to uh, um, manipulate our lives. And Paul says it's foolishness to those who don't believe. But for those of us who do believe, we know that God's words, God's ways, a power, are our salvation. And so, so uh, Malachi is reminding us of the sovereignty of God. The fact that God is in control. And in a day when we live in utter chaos, where everything is chaos around us, where we don't know who to believe, we don't know what to believe. What is the truth that has been told us in the media, on social media, on uh, news platforms? What is the truth? Well, we have an anchor of truth, and that is God. We have a God who is in control, who knows everything. Nothing is happening that he is surprised about. As we were reminded... Uh, in our opening, as uh, Stuart brought us uh, uh, Jesus' words from Matthew's Gospel, that we will hear of these things, we will see these things. But these things in and of themselves are not the end. They're just the beginning of the end. 
they are not, God is not taken by surprise by them. He knows they're going to happen. And yet he calls us to fix our eyes on him, to fix our hope in him, who is sovereign over all things. Nothing happens anywhere, anytime, in any way that God does not cause, does not allow, or does not know about. God is not evil. God is good. God does not make mistakes. But he allows things to happen for the bigger picture. We don't know what the bigger picture is. God does. The question for us this morning is, will we trust him even when things are tough for us personally? Even when we can't fathom what God is doing, will we trust him? The difference between uh, true uh, life-giving faith and, and a faith that relies on God giving us everything that we want is when, when, when we think God is supposed to give us everything we want, it belies the fact that God often uses not giving us everything we want to teach us. And in those moments of struggle, in those moments of difficulty of pain of suffering we actually grow the most we actually learn the most and we actually trust God the most and so we don't believe the prosperity gospel we believe that God gives us good things and he gives us everything that we need But he wants to teach us as well and we know through experience that we often learn the most through the most difficult challenging times when we have to struggle through but we don't struggle through on our own we struggle through with God we're reminded uh, in in these verses that not only does God know everything, not only does God allow what's happened, not, not, not only does God cause things to happen, but he is a God of the big stuff as well as the small things in life. He is a God of the big things as well as the small things. And maybe I've said that the wrong way around because we can recognise God in the big things. It's maybe in the small things that we fail to recognise him. Do we allow God to be sovereign in our day-to-day -day decisions? In our, not just uh, our career path, but uh, where we live. Um, our children's education. Where, you know, who we're going to marry. They're, 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 they're the big things. But... What about the small things? Do I allow God to be sovereign with my money? Each and every day. Do I allow God to be sovereign over my time each and every day? Do I allow God to be sovereign in every area of my life? God wants to be intimately involved in every area of our lives. He wants to be intimately involved in the decisions that we make. Do we consult God on all decisions, whether they're big decisions or whether they're small decisions? And each one of us has to make those decisions every single day. For us personally, in terms of the big decisions, I mean, the obvious ones uh, are us moving from Swords to Balbriggan a couple of years ago. We could not have done that in and of ourselves. We could not have done that in our own sense. We needed, to, uh, we needed God for that. And if God had have not wanted us to be here, we wouldn't have been here. We consulted God every step of the way. And there were moments in that where we really had to trust. Me moving to Ireland, another big decision. 
What about where, where we send our children to school? How we spend our money? Again, involving God in our decision making. And so, so the question then really is, can we trust God with our decisions? Can we trust God with our life? Can we trust God in the big things as well as the small things? Does God really care about us enough? And I was reminded that as, as those questions came to my mind, as, as, as I was preparing, as, as I was studying uh, for for today I was reminded that in Matthew's gospel again uh, chapter 10 verse 30 that uh, Jesus when, when, when he's talking to, to uh, the crowd he, he's reminding them how much God actually loves them and he, he goes on to say how much more will God how much more does God care about you how much more will God give you good things he, he, he says that not a single hair on your head falls without God knowing about it he knows how many hairs we have on our head he knows us so intimately far beyond anything we even know of ourselves he says that's a level God cares about you that's a level that God loves you that's a level that God that's a level of detail God wants to be involved in in your life trust him put your hope in him put your faith in him involve him in your life allow him to direct your feet direct your path every day not just when you get to a crossroads, but every step. Allow him to guide you, to direct you. And he said, Malachi says that the day of judgment is coming. And he says it's coming for all who are arrogant. So the question is, what does it mean to be arrogant in the kingdom of God? In God's economy, what is arrogance? Well, ultimately, it is thinking we know better than God in any given circumstance, any given situation. That my way is better than God's way. We see that all the way back in the Garden of Eden with Eve and Adam. They went their own way instead of God's way. We see that in, in the build up to Noah's life and, and, and the ark. People go in their own way. We see that in the family of Abraham. We see that in the uh, children of uh, Israel as they wander through the wilderness. We see that in the nation of Israel. As they settle in the promised land. Constantly going their own way. Constantly doing things their own way. God says this is arrogance. And those who are arrogant. A day of judgment is coming. When you will be set ablaze. He said, and so, so we see here. What we looked at in Revelation. Uh, when we looked at Revelation earlier this year, uh, uh, on the day of the Lord, where those who have rejected Christ are thrown into the lake of fire. This is not to scare us. This is for those who trust in Jesus. This is meant to bring, this is words to give us life. But it is meant to cause fear for those who are outside of Christ at this moment in time so that they will come to Christ. Humble themselves, fall at the knees and declare him as Lord in repentance. Arrogance is thinking that we know better than God. As I say, thinking that we can outmaneuver God. That we can trick him some way. Thinking that we can outlive God. Thinking ultimately that we can be God. 
This is what arrogance is. And Malachi in verse 1 of chapter 4 says, For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. In other words, they're totally cut off from the kingdom of God. They have nothing left. Everything is gone. There's no future. There's no, their past has been burnt up. Their future has been burnt up. Their present has been burnt up. All their possessions, all the things that they put their hope and their trust in, are gone. And it happens on the day of the Lord. Which we know to be the day of judgment. We know that to be at the end uh, as we looked at Revelation. We, kn we know the order. And so, this morning, the question for us... Are we going to choose the way of arrogance, the way of thinking we know better than God, the way of trying to outmaneuver God, the way of trying to outlive God, the way of thinking that we can be God? Or are we going to choose to humble ourselves and be clothed with the righteousness of Christ? Because the next verse, verse 2 says that the righteous will see a new day. And of course we, we know that our righteousness is not our own, it is Christ's righteousness uh, covering us, clothing us, so that when God sees us, he sees the righteousness of Christ and he declares us righteous because of it. And Malachi says it, that it is for those who fear the name of the Lord. Now, now fear is isn't the same as the fear that we've just been talking about where where we don't want to experience this fire we're afraid of the fire and what it might do so therefore we humble ourselves this is a different type of fear this is a fear that knows who god is knows what god has said will happen for those who reject him so we know what rejection looks like, but we love him, we trust him, we worship him, we have due respect for him. I guess it's, it's a bit like uh, if, if you uh, are into animals, uh, and, uh, or, or you're like me rather, uh, uh, don't particularly uh, care for animals in, in the house, uh, uh, particularly dogs. I, I don't like dogs. I, I don't like them uh, uh, biting at my ankles and, and, and things like that. I've uh, been bitten a couple of times, uh, um, particularly when riding a bike and dogs, particularly little ones, come yapping at your heels. Uh, so, so, so for that reason, I, I, you might say I have a fear of dogs. And yet my fear of dogs is I, I can be near them, I can, uh, I can walk past them, I, I can visit a house with them in um, as long as I know they're under control. Uh, because I know ultimately they're not generally that vicious. They're generally not going to harm me a great deal unless I do something to it. And I know that. So, so, so there is a, maybe a fear there, but it's not a big fear. However, if I was to walk past a wild lion, I'm going to take precautions, aren't I? A lot more than I would if I walked past a dog. Because I have a heightened fear. I know what a lion is capable of. I know what a dog is capable of, and it's a different type of uh, fear. Or, or, or if you go to a uh, zoo, you can go up to a cage with a lion in and you they look great, don't they? But you're not going to go and uh, go right up to a lion in the wild, are you? Why? Because we know what a lion is capable of. 
we have a respect for its strength, we have a respect for what it might do. And this is the type of fear that we're talking about. We go, we have a respect for who God is, what God is capable of, and what God might do. And so, so it, it is it's a different type of fear than the fear that uh, of of judgment, uh, a, a fear uh, that uh, um, brings us to repentance. It's a fear that respects God acknowledges who God is and and Malachi said those who are righteous are those who fear God those who respect him those who acknowledge who he is what he is capable of doing and that we would rather put our hope and our trust in him than in man that uh, we would fear his judgment more than we would fear man's judgment And he says, doesn't he, in verse 2, But for you who fear the name of the Lord, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing on its wings. The Son of Righteousness will rise. In other words, we will see a new day. Now, in uh, the, the word that he uses is a word that we will use for the sun that we have in the sky. The King James Version will often have that as a capital S because they see uh, a correlation between what Malachi has written and a prophecy towards the Son of God. Um, and yes, we can see that. But most modern translations will have it as a small s because they recognise that isn't the word that's used. And although we can see that because we know the Son of God, we know who he is, we know what he has done, that isn't actually what's saying here. What Malachi is actually saying is that we will see a new day. The sun is going to rise. A day of judgment isn't going to be the final day for us. It isn't going to be the end of our story where we are thrown into the lake of fire, but rather we are going to see a new day, a new heaven, a new earth, a new... Uh, a new beginning with God. So it depicts a new day rather than Jesus directly himself. But we know that that new day only comes through Jesus. So there is a sense that there is a messianic symbolism here. New day equals new life. And, and so, so though for... for for those who are in Christ now, we have already received that new day. We've already seen that new day because we've already received new life. We are a new creation in Christ Jesus, Paul tells us in, in the New Testament. We are a new creation. We, we have, the old is gone and the, we, we, have, we have been clothed with Christ. The old has died with Christ and we have been raised to new life in Christ. We have seen the new day. Eternity has already started for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Yes, we still live in this world. Yes, we still uh, have the effects of the fall around us and... We are still tempted to follow the effects of the fall. And sometimes we give in to that temptation. And we know that we call that sin. But for those of us who knew Christ, we have died to that. We are new beings in Christ Jesus. And so this day of righteousness where the sun will rise on those who fear God the, the sun of righteousness will rise is because we have seen a new day we have been born again Jesus says to Nicodemus in John's gospel and ultimately yes we are looking forward we are looking ahead in hope to a new heaven and a new earth when all evil has gone and we live in paradise with God where we dwell with him where he walks in the cool of the day with us as he did in the beginning and we wait for that day 
We long for that day. And he says that uh, the, the new day will rise with healing. This is pointing towards a new creation. It is pointing to the time where there will be no more pain, no more illness, no more sorrow, where the curse of sin is fully lifted. But as he goes on in this chapter, he points this day to the first coming of Jesus as well as the end of time. He says, in Christ Jesus, this will be the reality for those who put their trust in the Messiah that I am sending. We don't see the fullness of it. We don't see no more pain. We don't see no more illness now. We will do at the end. That's how we can see that it's pointing both to now and to the end. We receive new life now. We are a new creation now. But the fullness of this, no more pain, the healing in its wings, the no more pain, the no more illness, the no more sorrow, the curse of sin lifted. That is at the end, on the final day, of that is when all sin has passed away. And we are brought into paradise. So what does righteousness mean in the kingdom of God? We've already noticed that our righteousness is not our own. It is Christ Jesus. In Romans uh, chapter 3 verse 31 uh, we read. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. We know it's not about law keeping rule keeping in and of itself grace comes first we are clothed in christ's righteousness the moment we put our trust in him we are declared righteous so it's apart from the law that's not that we are not called to obedience which we will look at in a moment but our righteousness is christ jesus in further on, uh, I'll just uh, back a little bit in chapter 3 of Romans in verse 28. For we hold that no one, so, sorry, for we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works. Again, it's not our behaviour. It's our trust in Christ. And in Romans chapter 4, Paul goes on to write in verse 3. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Faith equals righteousness. So we're not righteous by our behaviour. We're not righteous by doing the right things. We are righteous through the blood of Christ. That is the only way to be righteous. It's the only way to be right with God. That's what righteousness means for us. Right with God. And it is only through the blood of Jesus. It's not through our behaviour. It's not through our works. It is through the blood of Jesus Christ. And this, knowing this, trusting this, sets us free. Sets us free to honour God and to worship him. Not under obligation, but out of an attitude of gratefulness, of thanksgiving, because of all that he has done. I was uh, watching a, a conference last night and I was reminded that grace comes before truth. That we are saved by grace before we are asked to walk in the truth, before we are given the standard to live by. And so often we insist people, we, we give people the truth. But we fail to give them grace. We, we, we insist that they obey before they experience the grace of God. Do you know what? It's impossible to obey God without having first experienced his grace. Because if we're striving and we're striving, uh, if, if, if we have to obey before we experience grace, our grace is conditional. Is conditional on our obedience. And yet God, while we were still sinners, sent his son to die for us so that we might have a life in him. We are no longer bound by sin or its curse when we clothe ourselves with the righteousness 
of Jesus through his blood. It is his blood that sets us free. So we do come on to verse 4. Where Malachi reminds his listeners and reminds us to remember the law of my servant Moses. The statutes and the rules that I have commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. So we are called here to remember, to remember the law of my servant Moses. But I hear you say, but we are free from the law. Surely that's the point of Romans. And we've just quoted Romans, haven't we? We were looking at righteousness. Yes, we are free. But we're not, but, but out of gratitude, sorry, out of gratitude, we are called to obey because we have been set free. Because we are redeemed through the blood of Jesus, we are called to honour and obey God. Out of love, out of worship, out of uh, thankfulness for all that he has done. And I'm reminded, uh, as, as again, as, as, as I'm preparing and as, as I'm speaking, uh, Jesus' words in Matthew uh, chapter 28, verse 20, where he says, Teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. Teach them to obey. Who are, who are they to teach? They are to teach those they have made disciples. Those they have called to follow Jesus, teach them to obey. Everything I've commanded you. What does Jesus say? He says, I am the fulfillment of the law in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 to 20. He says, I have not come to abolish it. I have not come to uh, disband it. I have come to fulfill it. And not one dot, not one iota will be rubbed out. I am the fulfillment of the law. What does Jesus say the law is? Love God. And love people. If we're doing that we're keeping the law. We're keeping all of its requirements. If we're loving God with all our heart. With all our soul. With all our mind and all our strength. In other words our full faculties. Everything that we have. We bring it all to God. Remember we looked at last week. It's about being generous with our time. Our talents. Our money etc. Bringing all that we have to God. Because it's all his anyway. Love God wholeheartedly and love others as you love yourself. Well, how do we love ourselves? Well, generally, we would love ourselves wholeheartedly. We want the best for ourselves, don't we? We want, we want comfort. We, we want things to go well for us all the time, don't we? That's what we want. So to love other people so that it goes well for them, so that you're meeting their needs. So you can be the answer to their prayers. Love people sacrificially. Love, Go the extra mile for them. So when you're doing that, you're fulfilling the law. So obey everything that I commanded you. Obedience is an act of worship. Remember earlier on he says, You've, I don't accept your worship. Why? Why wasn't God accepting their worship? Because it wasn't an act of love. It wasn't an act... It, they, they weren't doing it in obedience, they were doing it grudgingly. And they were skimping, they were giving God what was left over, rather than what was the best. Obedience is an act of worship. And I'm reminded that we obey, we respect, we listen to those we love. It is a call to remember God's word. The whole of scripture, all of scripture, again Paul writes to Timothy, all of scripture is God breathed and is good for correcting, rebuking, for building up, for establishing us in the ways of God. My paraphrase. It's a, remem it's as a call to remember God's word. Don't neglect reading God's word. Don't neglect meditating on it. Don't neglect studying it. It is a call not to give up. One of the charges that God had on them is that they were uh, 
they were saying that evil was good and good was evil that that there was no point honoring god because god blessed the evil people more than they blessed them and he's saying don't give up don't give up doing good don't give up obey me don't give up doing things my way don't give up on me don't give up on god don't give up on obeying god keep persevering because the sun will rise on the righteous and on the day of the Lord the arrogant the wicked will perish into eternal fire and we're reminded of that as we look at verses 5 and 6 the day of the Lord is a reminder that God will bring judgment to the earth and we've been reminded as we've been looking at this that the day of the Lord is any day that God intervenes in human history. So the day of the Lord was the day that uh, God called Noah. The day of the Lord when God brought Noah into the ark. The day of the Lord was when God called Abraham. When God uh, intervened and saved Lot out of Sodom and Gomorrah. The day of the Lord was when uh, uh, God intervened and brought David through trials and tribulations. The day of the Lord was when Jesus was born. The day of the Lord was his death, his resurrection. The day of the Lord was the coming of the Holy Spirit. The day of the Lord is the day when he called us to follow him. He intervened in our lives, in, that, in, in our history, so that we would walk with him in our future. The day of the Lord is the end, the great and glorious day of the Lord. In some translations, in my translations it says, uh, let me just find it again. The great and awesome day of the Lord in verse 5. In other words, the day that has been set apart for final judgment. And he says, before all of this happens, before the final day of judgment, I'm going to send my Messiah. And before I send him, I'm going to send Elijah. Who is Elijah? Well, as, as we've noticed, uh, he's men um, Malachi has mentioned Moses and Elijah in verses 4 and, and, and 6. He's bringing out the two prophets, the two main prophets of the Old Testament. Moses, who gave the law, and Elijah, who stood against the oppression of his day, stood against the systems of his day, stood against the ruling power of his day to call people to repentance. So we've got the lawgiver and we've got the call to repentance. And, and, and so Moses, we see, is a forerunner to Jesus, the lawgiver. Elijah is a forerunner to John the Baptist who calls us to repentance and we notice that in the uh, beginning of chapter 3 when we looked at that a couple of weeks ago where Jesus said uh, where, where God sorry, was saying I'm sending my messenger ahead of my messenger and he will prepare the way for the one who is coming the Messiah and the one who comes before him, we know that the New Testament new writers knew was John the Baptist. And they use uh, Malachi's prophecy to prove that John the Baptist is the one who he's preparing the way. And the one he was preparing the way for was Jesus, the Messiah. And so, so Elijah here isn't Elijah coming back from the dead. Or coming back from eternity. 
should I say. Elijah here is a symbolism of what the messenger will do. He will call people to repentance so that they are ready to receive the Messiah. They are ready to receive the gift of new life when it is offered to them. As I say, Elijah stood against king. He stood against hypocrisy. He stood against rejection of God. And as God's people today, we are called to stand against the king. We are stand to, called to stand against hypocrisy, against rejection of God, and to call people to repentance. And we notice that in, in Elijah's day, there was revival. When God proved that he was the one true God, people worshipped him. There was revival. And uh, for John's, in John's time, John the Baptist, there was revival. People came to repent so that they were ready to receive Jesus when he came. Now we know not everybody did that, we know that, and still not everybody does that. But re repentance leads to revival. And repentance and revival lead is a changed heart. It's where our hearts are changed, where we are no longer who we were, but we are new. We see that as, as uh, Malachi says, that uh, the hearts of fathers will turn to their children and the hearts of children will turn to their fathers. We see hearts are changed. And when hearts are changed, relationships change. First of all, our relationship to God changes. But also our relationship to each other within families. Broken relationships are restored when we are renewed in Christ Jesus. Broken relationships are restored. And we can see God at work when we see relationships being restored. We see God at work when we see people's hearts changed. We know we stand different to the world because we are different. Our eyes are fixed on Christ, not the world. Our standards are God's, not the world's. Therefore, we will sound and we will be accused of Uh, being against so much we will be accused of being um, uh, mean we will be accused of being intolerant is actually the word I was thinking of and yet that's not it it's a, we have a standard and we live by it but remember grace comes before truth we are still to be gracious with people, but we are to call them with, within that grace when we earn the right to speak truth through grace to teach the truth as well. And we call people to repentance. We call people to God's standards. That's what Malachi was doing. That's what John the Baptist did. That's what we as Christ's followers today, a call to ourselves and we are to call others too. So in conclusion this morning, God is going to judge the world. There's no getting away from that. The scripture is very clear on that. And he said the arrogant, those who have rejected God, those who think they can do better than God, will be consumed with fire. But the righteous those who have put their trust in Christ Jesus, those who are clothed in his righteousness, will see a new day. It is a call to be patient and remember God's word. It is a call to obedience. It is a call, as the rest of the book is, to take God seriously. Shall we pray? Lord God, uh, we uh, come to you uh, this morning uh, and uh, we... We just ask, Lord, that you will challenge us with what we've heard today. Lord, that you will encourage us 
to persevere, to not give up on you, to trust you with the big and the small, to obey you because of the righteousness of the, you have clothed us in through the blood of Jesus. Lord, help us to remember how gracious you are with us and to be gracious with each other, to be gracious with the world around us. And Lord, when when through grace we earn the right to speak truth, give us a boldness to speak it as well to those who are near and dear to us because we don't want to see anyone consumed in the lake of fire. We want everyone, as you do, because you love the whole world so much that you sent your son to die on the cross that while we were still sinners you purchased those who will turn to you for yourself Lord we want everyone to turn to you so give us a boldness to speak truth through grace when the opportunities arise and help us to not neglect your word because it is the source, the power of life to us, of hope to us, because they are your words. In your name, Lord, I pray. Amen. We're going to uh, sing together again uh, just now before we have the announcements and uh, our benediction. We're going to sing uh, 10,000 Reasons. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, of course, that wasn't uh, 10,000 Reasons. That was uh, Before the Throne of God Above. Uh, thank you for uh, joining with us as we worship God with that song just there. Uh, just to remind you uh, of our announcements. First of all, that we have our Coffee Fellowship uh, today on our Facebook Rooms. Um, it's the same link as it has been uh, in previous weeks. Uh, just give me about five minutes uh, just to uh, uh, get my own cup of tea uh, and, um, and to actually set up the room there. Uh, so just a, a reminder that we have that after the service. This Tuesday we're back to having our Bible studies on Tuesday this week, uh, Tuesday the 24th of November, 8 o'clock on Zoom. And again, the uh, code for that is in our newsletter. If you'd like to receive a newsletter, uh, let me have your email address if you haven't already and we can make sure that you get that. This coming Friday we have our Accelerate Youth uh, programme uh, on Zoom again at 8 o'clock and details will be sent uh, uh, to the youth and their parents ahead of that this week. One coming event for you, so this is on Thursday the December the 3rd. We've Put a, a note on this on our Facebook page at 11 o'clock. Uh, Tear Fund, uh, which is a charity that uh, myself and Nancy uh, have supported in the past as well. Um, they're having a virtual coffee morning on Zoom uh, uh, on Thursday, December the 3rd at 11 o'clock. It'll be about an hour and a half uh, that, that they're uh, uh, setting aside for it. And it's to raise money for 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 the work that they do and while you're on the coffee morning there'll be some people just talking about the work of Tear Fund in Ireland uh, during that coffee morning. You can purchase tickets, um, there's a link on our newsletter and on our Facebook page to purchase tickets. They do cost five euros. You can purchase as many tickets as you like. Uh, if you want to donate more than five euros to them you can buy more than five tickets. Um, and uh, uh, all the money goes obviously to Tear Fund and, um, and the work that they do. Uh, remind your friends about it, uh, anyone who wants to support them, uh, get them to buy a, 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 a ticket to join in on that. Even if you can't join in, if you want to uh, donate money, this is a great way of just donating them uh, some money as well. Uh, so uh, just to let you know that is uh, uh, as we we can uh, hold a coffee morning for them in person this year uh, like we did last year uh, but so we will um, be supporting them in in this way as well so if you'd like to do that uh, the opportunity is there And then finally, our uh, live stream worship next Sunday, the 29th of November. Uh, can you believe it's the end of November already almost? Uh, next Sunday at 10.30 a.m. Uh, on Facebook and uh, on YouTube, we will be live uh, for our live stream worship. And also just to, to remind you um, uh, to uh, continue to give uh, to the church so that we can meet our um, obligations uh, as a church as we meet uh, the ministry needs uh, within the church at this time. Uh, there are numerous ways you can give. Uh, we have sent out uh, the lodgement slips to people. If you've not received that and you think you should have, uh, let us know. Uh, you can also give uh, through PayPal. You can also give uh, directly uh, through bank transfer uh, with online banking as well. Uh, so uh, again, all the details within the letter that we sent with the uh, lodgement slip and they're also on our newsletter as well. Uh, and you can also access our PayPal account through uh, our website. So just to remind you of that as well. Uh, we're going to share in the benediction just now and then uh, give me uh, around five minutes just to set up the Facebook rooms. Okay, thank you. Our benediction is from 1 Peter chapter 5 today, uh, verses 10 and 11. After you have suffered for a little while, 
the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen.